Hello, my name is Kevin Hong. Over the past few months, I and other Penn State students have collaborated on a massive installation project that currently adorns our campus. This project, spearheaded by artist and activist David Buckley Borden, centers around the numerical data of climate change. His vision was for a series of graphs that materialize the realities of climate change that seem abstract in America. Rising sea levels and wildfire are already becoming an accepted part of reality here. But most people in this country don't know or think about wildfire extinction or famines that already affect millions in the globe south. So we talked to the students with very levels of familiarity to see what they know and what insights they might have or have to move forward. I hope you enjoy. So what do you know about climate change? Um, it's warming of the earth and it's getting worse. Uh, I'd say a little bit, not as much as I'd like to. I mean, I know that it's uh, affecting our world today. We don't do anything about it. It can be some serious consequences for years to come. Um, I know that it's very relevant now, and some people don't really believe in it, which doesn't make sense, but... I mean, I know a little bit, but it's not really that much. What do you think about climate change? Well, I think climate change is, um, like, it's, like, affecting the global world, so, like, everyone's getting affected right now, and um, I feel like we need to step up our game and really help the environment out a little bit, because um, right now we're dealing with, like, um, natural disasters, and you see more and more of this in the future, so I think we should, like, like start helping and, like, just brand it so we, can, so we can produce, like, the next generation and for our kids and grandchild and for the, so on. So what do you think about climate change? Um, I do believe that climate change is a real phenomenon that's happening currently and that we definitely need to take action about it now since we have the time and resources to do so. Okay, so you think that's like a huge threat to, um, of life on Earth, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely think that climate change is something that is going to affect, it's affecting us now and it's definitely going to affect us along. along. What do you know about climate change? What I know about climate change is that it is not climate change, it is climate crisis. We are in the depths of a serious, serious problem and our world is changing. And even from the age of a small child, like looking at it now, it's like you can definitely see the vast change that has been happening since even we were kids. So yeah, I like to call it a climate crisis over climate change because it's not changing. It's been changing our whole lives. It is a crisis at this point in time. I think that's absolutely fair to say, uh, especially if you look at what's happening just outside of our country, which is why so many people are kind of blind to it, because things are almost the same here. It's been, a, it's been change here, but Greenland lost 250 billion tons of ice in just last year. Uh, millions of people in India just don't have clean water. They have to deliver it in trucks. So I think you're absolutely right to call it a crisis because it stopped being a change decades ago. So are you concerned about the survivability of Earth, or what, what worries you most? The survivability of the Earth. Um, all of it, I guess? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I mean, a lot of people are different, worried about different things. Some people are worried about earthquakes, or floods, or starvation, fires. Like, there, it is terrifying for a lot of reasons, but we're also asking what people are most afraid of, because there's so much. I guess the natural disasters like that are it, yeah. No, so how concerned about it are you? Um, very. Like, I stopped littering and all that stuff. Like, I really had to change my, my whole self because that's, like, it's a big issue. Like, we all live on this planet and it's kind of like, we're destroying it ourselves, so. So, what part of it is the most concerning? Like, fires, floods, droughts? I would say the fires, because Cali is on fire every day. Like, can we talk about that for a second? <laughs> like, yeah, it's bad. It's really bad. What are you most concerned about? Um, I guess the, um, how not just the human race, but kind of all living beings are going to continue surviving if the climate changes dramatically. Right, so you're worried about global extinction? Yes, I'd say so. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty valid concern, <laughs> I'd say. Uh, like you hear some people I know that my dad does this a lot is he'll say like oh well good let the mankind be destroyed because we're <laughs> the ones killing the earth and it's like no dude it, it's coming with us <laughs> yeah yes. Yeah, it, it's good to have concern for everything and not just us I think that's a important part of understanding how we got here in the first place exactly I mean are you concerned yeah definitely yeah, I'm it's, 
what are you guys most worried about with the way that things are going? Like my children, like my children's children, like how, what kind of world they're going to live in. Yeah, I, I think that's really valid. People are concerned not just for their own physical safety, but just the future in general for everyone. Yeah. It's, uh, it is concerning. Just a simple fact that um, temp- like summers are getting hotter, winters are getting colder. And it, yeah, the, t- the temperature is definitely is a big concern to me, especially since high temperatures are even destroying like the polars, mm-hmm. our south and north poles, mm-hmm. climates and all that. I was actually watching this um, Netflix. It, it's about, um, um, it's, it's called 100, the 100, because it, it talks about like people actually surviving um, the planet disaster. So I was kind of referring that to like, how we're going to survive in the future when um, climate changes and like how our like next generation is going to like find like abilities to survive. So I think it's really important that we start like taking action now so that in the future it doesn't affect like the rest of our generation. What aspect of the Earth's survivability are you most concerned about? Um, the ocean. Uh, I've been a scuba diver for the past three years now and after doing a lot of research I found that coral reefs produce half of the oxygen that we breathe in the air and also collect a third of the carbon monoxide that goes into our atmosphere so I believe oceans are a huge part of saving our planet and especially since if you think about it we can't survive without water and if the ocean disappears it's we it'd be mars there's no way we can live on this planet without water now i don't want to get too ahead of myself but uh i was curious about that because algae also produces a lot of oxygen right it does so do you at all see a future where maybe uh people just have algae farms that span uh hectares or acres definitely most definitely. Also, um, seaweed, and also I've been looking into moss a lot recently. Moss, right. just as like a land plant, uh, does really well at collecting carbon monoxide, and I've been looking into the vertical walls and the vertical gardens about uh, collecting carbon monoxide in our atmosphere. Awesome. Um, how long have you cared passionately about this? How long have you been like sort of fighting for this cause in any capacity? Right, well, I have always obviously loved our planet, but I guess it wasn't really until my freshman year of college that I realized that, like, something really needs to be done. Um, I recently became a vegan after trying vegetarianism, but I've changed everything in my lifestyle from my plastics that I consume to the food that I eat, um, and just because I have become a very serious advocate for the planet after realizing that there's not much we can do except for our own lives and fixing what we can do ourselves. What do you do personally to reduce the effects of climate change? Um, probably not as much as I should be doing. You can send us. Nothing. You don't have to go back. Is there anything that you do in your daily life to try to make things better? Uh, I try to. I try to use as little water and as little uh, electricity as I can when I don't like I don't like to leave the lights on if I'm not in the room or the water running if I don't need it so little things like that I try to do but I feel like I could do more too. That's actually probably better than most people honestly <laughs> which is a problem we all need to do a lot more together but uh, it's good that you're in the upper half so far. <laughs> So I heard about like the whole metal straw phenomenon. So I plan to like, you know, get my family on that whole thing. Me also, cause turtles are cute. Like stop killing them. Like, you know, these the animals supposed to live for hundreds of years and they're slowly going extinct. Like that's an issue. What do you do personally to reduce the effects of climate change? Recycle. That's a good start. That's, that's about it on your review. I mean, that's all that, mo- that's more than most people do probably. <laughs> it's. That's one of the things, is that it's going to take everyone to do their part uh, with a lot of energy. What do you do personally to reduce the effects of climate change? Well, I like recycling, so recycling is part of one of my um, reduce in like the, um, part of the climate change movement. Mm-hmm. So like, and I'll just give you an example. So in Japan, people um, tend to do recycling a lot because like they, they want to uh, have a cleaner environment. Yeah. And I really think that helps like clean up the ocean a little bit and uh, reduce like the waste in our environment. So recycling is like part of the movement that um, I'm part of too. Um, I personally do a lot of gardening. I have a garden in my house um, that I take care of, um, mostly because I do it as a hobby. <laughs> but I do that to take care of uh, climate change. Um, I also do, um, I use a lot of like solar power stuff. Mm-hmm. So I 
try to get anything that requires solar energy to like consume energy or even solar panels. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. What should people do every day? Oh, What's this is a great question. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a or one we could start at um, a reusable water bottle. Awesome. That's my biggest point. Um, you can save thousands of water bottles from going into our ecosystem just by using a reusable water bottle. Second, uh, plastic bags. Uh, I, I always keep reusable bags in my car, just so when I go grocery shopping, I don't have to bring plastic bags back with me. And even if I do forget my reusable bags, I walk out carrying my groceries just in my hands because plastic is literally not worth it at all. Um, again, veganism or vegetarianism or just limiting the amount of meat intake that comes into your body because animals do produce again a lot of bad things that go into our ecosystem we waste a lot of things on our animals uh, that we could be using in other aspects like water for example we waste so much water on these animals whereas and we're also wasting plants on these animals and all of our resources on these animals so i think it's a great even if you can't like totally commit to going vegan just like it's a amount, amount of trying, like just a little bit here and there works wonders. Also like just like turning your water off when you're brushing your teeth, in right. between washing your hands. It's like the little things. What do you think should be done at a national or international level? By acknowledging that it's a real thing and passing acts to make it a... Uh, to help fix it and change it? Yeah. Um, I think we definitely need to start moving more towards renewable energy sources and because I feel like we're way too reliant on stuff like, you know, oil and stuff like that, which is not only non-renewable, but also not good for the environment. So I feel like we start need to start making that change to, to uh, energy sources that are not only renewable, but, but better to use for the environment. I think that that's a fantastic answer. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely need more of that. In fact, I'd go as so far as to say we need only that. Yes. They should be making more laws and policies towards it and stop focusing on frivolous things that don't really matter. Like, for example, this wall. What does that have to do with anything? Our planet is slowly deteriorating and you're worried about a wall. Like... <laughs> Yeah, it is a fantastic waste of resources um, and money, which is really good for anyone who pays taxes. International level, um, I would just tell Donald Trump to <laughs> step off and let someone else take the lead. All right. Yeah, because right. he doesn't believe in climate change, and he's part of like the, the fuel, fossil fuel, and um, the pollution. Okay. He's a bad guy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I believe we should try to definitely move towards more solar power stuff mm -hmm. and definitely cut down um definitely stop the whole deforestation process of like cutting down trees as our main source of material and all that and definitely cut down on many factories that like provide a lot of pollution in the air and basically thicken the atmosphere what the is mm -hmm. is. yeah what do you think should be done at a national or international level? What should the people that are in charge be doing to combat climate change? Um, I feel like they should be educating people more about it. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions that people have about climate change. Like, some people don't even think it's real. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think more awareness on the topic should be like addressed more occasionally. Like, it's mentioned here and there, but it's mostly due to like catastrophes that happen, let's say an oil spill in the ocean, that's when the news actually captures most of the attention to like, oh, climate change. But like, they don't do it on a casual level, which is kind of like what should be addressed at the moment. Would you believe that we've known about the effects of climate change since roughly 1912? Most likely, yeah. That seems a bit early, but like, I, could, I guess it's a possibility. I mean, if you kind of think of how much um, consumption every age person does and then like multiply that by like the amount of people there are i think it's very likely that you can think of that absolutely the reason that i ask is because that is the first documented uh, article that i found about it is 1912 so for over a hundred years the people in charge have been trying to make sure that people don't know about what's happening to the planet so what do you guys think we should do about that how do you how do you get that information out there when the people in charge don't want it to be known? Um, honestly, I think awareness on social media is probably a good idea. Um, 
definitely teaching about it like at a young age like people in elementary school we talk about uh teachers can talk about climate change things like that like because if we start learning about it young then we're gonna like it's gonna be part it's gonna become a part of us like we're gonna just know it um have you ever heard about the amazon forest fire that happened a few weeks ago yeah i heard about it in the news do you think that's actually related to climate change yes it is Cause um I think in the past I mean the wildfire happened but like nowadays you see more and more wildfires start to occur so that's like related to climate change it's like the temperature just can keep increasing so you will see more of that um uh, occurring happen yeah yep that's true that's um I I definitely do think it has to do with climate change um because it's been the Am- for the Amazon to. Being such a big like environment and such a big forest environment for so many animals and even people, for it to just catch on fire out of nowhere and mm-hmm. still be burning, it's very concerning and very disturbing to hear and see happening. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So climate change also have uh, an increase of the extreme weather events. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely kind of related to it. Yeah. So what should we do about it? Do you think we should really just start planning for it? We should like start taking actions. Like we should cut down on like power, like power plants. Open up like more, like more eco-friendly systems that you know doesn't affect our world like that. Um, so what should we do about it? I think that's the part that I don't know enough about that I'd like to learn more about because I know. I'd like to learn more about what scientists are doing to kind of find solutions to solve the problem. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about global warming, or do you have any questions for me about it? What's your view on global warming? Oh well, I mean that's it, that would take quite a while, but um, the base of it is that it threatens essentially all life on Earth, and we need to immediately retroactively change. The way that we do everything, it needs a complete restructuring of manufacturing and society in general. The way that things have been for hundreds of years cannot continue if we value our survival. So, like, when is it going to become inevitable? Like, the world is going to keep changing. Well, the estimates that I've heard is that as soon as 12 years, we'll hit a point where there will be a feedback loop from wildfires, and even without man-made intervention, the it, Climate will just make itself hotter and hotter uh, without us doing anything. So it looks like we have until then to try to stop carbon emissions and, in fact, go carbon negative in order to pull back and save us from cataclysmic global warming by the end of the century. So that's about the timeline that we're looking at: is 12 years for drastic changes. That is not good. <laughs> that is not good at all. What should people plan to do instead of something that like can start tomorrow? What should someone plan to do within the next month or next couple of months? What's a project that people should get going just to take upon themselves? Um, well, I think it's really important that we plant more trees.、Um, so I think if you are someone who lives at home or somewhere that has a yard or in a community that has a lot of land, I think it's really important that. You take the time and just plant a few trees in your backyard, or ask members of your community if you'd be allowed to plant trees. Because planting trees is also, again, a great way at taking out that CO2 from our air. What about in the next year? What's a massive project that someone can take on with their family or their community that has a little bit more staying power than just the small everyday changes?、Hmm. Well, I'd have to go with. Your cars and public transportation. I think it's a matter of also limiting how much you're in your car, where you're going. I think it's really important to start walking, using your bike, using public transportation. Even though the United States has not the best public transportation, it is still definitely yeah, something that <laughs> yeah, it's still <laughs> you can you can find it. It's not as good as Europe, but you can find public transportation or carpooling. Carpooling is so important. Like if you could fit as many people as seats in your car, then that is limiting the amount of cars that are out on our streets, which is limiting the amount of CO2 going into our atmosphere. Absolutely. What resources should people go to? For activism, any books, groups, websites. How do people get their foot in the door in being a much more responsible citizen, other than their home projects?、Um, so, 
Fridays for Future. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about it. If you haven't heard about it, Fridays for Future is an amazing organization that is school students skipping school on Fridays uh, to bring awareness to the fact that our planet is dying. Um, I follow them on Instagram. Uh, also, Greta Thunberg is like the highest woman of that organization. Oh, she's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic woman. Uh, if you don't know Greta Thunberg, she's someone you should definitely look into. But also, um, I do follow a lot of um, activists that are from, um, how do I put this? Like, they're locals, I guess, but in, in areas like Brazil and places that are actually like witnessing firsthand right. the kind of problems that are happening, like flooding and the forest burning down and indigenous people. That's what right. I was looking for. But I feel like there's a lot of those. I would I can look up some names at some point in time, but I definitely recommend looking into the younger activists because they're who are on top of things. I don't recommend looking into any adult politicians because... <laughs> Quite frankly, they don't know shit. So, um, it's all about the youth. Um, and if not, if you can't find anyone to look into, there's always Google. Google is a great, great tool. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Carly. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you, guys. Hello, I'm speaking live with the notorious DBB, David Buckley Borden, who is responsible for bringing this project to Abington. So I have a couple of questions for you, David. Is that all right? Please. All right. So... First of all, how would you describe your art to laymen who aren't necessarily into art and don't know that much about it? Uh, good question. I always describe my practice as a combination of visual art um, and design, or so environmental design, and combining elements of uh, ecology or environmental education. Cool, very cool. So, furthermore, what would you tell someone who's well-versed in art, art history, climate change, uh, someone who already knows what you're about and wants to hear uh, your angle on it in a more technical way? I would frame it as an interdisciplinary practice with roots in landscape architecture, um, with a public engagement component, as well as a research, um, it's research driven, I guess is a nice way to frame it as well. All right, so I know this is sort of a broad question, but what inspires your work? Um, the future, you know, developing a future or playing a role in pro producing or promoting a future that um, is hopeful and welcoming versus one that is filled with doom and dread. Now, regarding the future, would you consider yourself optimistic, pessimistic, idealistic, realistic? What do you, what do uh, you think? How, how are things going to go down here? I think it depends on the day of the week and the time of the day for <laughs> yeah. me, but generally I'm an optimist, um, which is I think why I do this type of work. I think... Um, we don't have a really lot of capacity right now for negativity, so um, yeah, I'm, I take the bright side, obviously. Very good, very good. What can you tell me about the Data Decision Trees project? So the Data Decision Tree project is unfolding as we speak. Um, it is a community-driven, I guess, science communication project, in essence, that combines, again, art, science, and ecology. And really, the idea is that the student body um, is determining the narrative of the work by selecting certain data sets that they feel are relevant um, to their concerns for the present and the future. Um, it's also collaborative in intent and process in terms of the students are actually helping fabricate the work um, as well as support and promote the work, hence our interview. Absolutely, and I'd say this is great practice for anyone who is, like myself, an art major who is looking into getting into studio work full-time. This is the kind of thing that I'm sure we could expect to be doing for uh, artists when we first start working under them. This is one type of practice method or mode, but yeah, this is um, not atypical. So we talked yesterday, you're from Boston, right? <laughs> I always say I'm from Cambridge, but yeah, I'm from right. Massachusetts, yeah. So what made you bring this project to Abington? Um, well, there was an open call, so there was essentially a, uh, an invitation to apply, and um, they were looking for artists with an environmental interest, and I submitted my material, and in fact, Abington selected me. I didn't select them. Oh. <laughs> Very exclusive. All right. So, can you uh, explain your concept for this installation? Sure. It's basically the... The form or the formal concept is inspired by the Woodland Campus. Um, and we're taking essentially uh, an abstract tree, albeit a fallen down or a, a tree that is, is prone on the ground, um, 
and we're using that as a framework to communicate um, data on an X and Y value. You'll probably have to splice in some visuals for this to make yeah, sense. Yeah, we'll have that. But um, um, the so, X value is represented by the branches of the trees, and basically the idea is that it communicates broad trends in certain data sets, which again are being selected by the student body. So this concept came to you after you first got to Abington. It was inspired by uh, our Woodland campus? Absolutely, but you know, I have a long running interest in doing work that engages um, communities with data visualization. So, um, but yeah, the, you know, one of the things I'd noticed when I was here doing the tours that you had recently, the campus had recently gone through a, a big improvement process where they cut down a lot of trees and so it was evidence of lots of stumps. Right. And I was really eager. I was like, oh man, we gotta use the trees. We can use those part of the work. And they're like, well, the trees are gone, but I was still inspired. Right. Um, so then we just did an abstract version of the trees. Yeah. So how long has this project been in the works? God. From concept to present sure. construction. I'm guessing in the spring, sometime mid-spring, I guess? my initial site visit I'd have to check my notes how do you think of how it's coming along so far I think it's great I think the students have been absolutely tremendous in helping out um, did a ton of work in just two days there's a lot more work to be done but the attitude seems right and everyone seems enthusiastic and I'm looking forward to coming back in November for the final installation where we tweak everything so there's a lot more work ahead but um, yeah I feel really good about it all right and what is your best case scenario for what you accomplish with this project? Best case scenario for this project, as well as most projects, is that um, the audience, in particular the community, the Abington community, um, has a better understanding of um, their environmental situation on campus and the regional context and the global context. And ideally they feel a little more empowered to be their own environmental stewards um, based on what they learned through the process of making the work, but also just sharing the information that comes about from doing their research regarding um, their concerns about the environment. So not that one necessarily has to supersede the other, but what do you consider yourself more as, an artist or an activist? Um, I would say an activist, then a designer, then an artist. Good. I personally really like art that is about the message first and is really trying to get out there and say something before it considers uh, any of the other frilly details, so to speak. I, yeah, I like no. It's driven and about it's, something important. It's essentially, it's one type of conceptual art. And I agree. It's, uh, you know, I don't do representational art. I don't do art that's necessarily about me. Of course, my creative fingerprints are on the work, but uh, the work isn't about me. It's usually about so when it comes to the environment and climate change, what was your first awakening or radicalization, so to speak, on how dire the circumstances have become? Um, I suppose when I was in grad school, which is about 10 years ago, um, you know, I was on a landscape architecture program, and part of every project was doing a site analysis, and you're kind of critiquing the environmental condition, both good and the bad, and um, you realize that when you might pass by a really good-looking attractive landscape that might have all sorts of problems right below the surface or on the surface. Uh, so that's when I started kind of being a little more in tune to environmental conditions and the need for remediation and just being better landscape stewards. It's interesting because a lot of people who are all about the environment now are just doing it because of what they've heard in the news and it's very good that it's finally being reported on but a lot of people I think have that kind of alarmist idea of they're only just finding out about it now. I like that this is something that you've been considering since before it was in the popular day-to-day -day discourse. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's a big problem. There's a big table. Everyone step on up and yeah, take oh, a seat. Absolutely. We've got More lots of work. It's something that it's going to yeah. take all of us to yeah. solve. So what do you think our environment is going to look like in the future? Let's say, I don't know, 50 years from now. What, yeah, yeah. what do you think we're going to be looking at? What it looks like is tough to see. Say, but me being too literal, but I think the experience will be greatly different than it is today. Absolutely. I think it's going to continue to develop into a more inhospitable climate, so hotter in places, wetter in others, drier in um, a lot. others, yep. Um, 
And I think, you know, the environment or ecology is always a dynamic process. I think we're just going to be seeing a lot more extremes. And unfortunately, I think um, people are going to weather those extremes in different capacities based on, frankly, their resources. So the disenfranchised and the poor will get hurt more. The rich and the folks arguably causing a lot of these issues. I mean, we're all, we all play a role, don't get me wrong. But, um, but you, perhaps... you can be one-sided here. <laughs> like. There is a pretty clear right and wrong when it comes to climate change, and I, I don't need to I obscure we're all, that. We're, we're all culprits. I mean, we all contribute. Anyone who is a consumer contributes, essentially. Absolutely. To be alive in America is to consume something. Oh, 100%. Um, how do you think the world will handle climate change? Be it the world governments, the citizens, what do you think the mass social reaction to this kind of disaster is going to look like? Um, I think you're starting to see Thankfully, it play out now. I think it's gonna be um, it's gonna be a ground up. Um, basically, people are gonna what I imagine is gonna happen is take to the streets. You know, all of the 60s and 70s, and I think that'll force a lot of government and then thus industry to adjust. Uh, you know, some industry is being proactive, most are not. Um, some governments are being very proactive. Ours, as of this <laughs> moment in time, is not. Um, so it's gonna be it's gonna be messy. I can tell you that. It's gonna be messy. What do you think the role of activists is, that is, people who are already aware and doing their best now, is going to be in the future when things do get messier? Um, I think there's a real opportunity for activists to be community leaders. So kind of on the ground, grassroots uh, initiatives, I think have always been really important to any kind of um, social change or social um, agendas or programs. I'm not sure what the right word choice is. Um, but I think, you know, they're, they're people that can organize and, you know, have a, a long-term view um, are really needed at this point in time, and activists often fit that role, although not always. So, you're an artist. People who make movies are artists. <laughs> what movie do you think best predicts uh, the future of climate change? There have been a number that have come out in past decades, like WALL-E, Mad Max, Waterworld. On the road? I'm... Yeah. No, 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 no. Who do you On think has road? it best so far? <laughs> No. no um, God, no. Give me a second. I'm a slow, slow thinker sometimes. I can't. You got me. You got me. You got to cut this one out. All right. All right. <laughs> I'll think of one the second we're done. We'll okay. Back. Yeah. Let's come back to that. One. Yeah, we can splice right. that back in. <laughs> um, last Let's question. Continuous shot. Last question. Do you have any solutions or policies or critiques of current solutions in place uh, on what to do moving forward? I think it's going to, the solutions is going to be like a campaign. It's not going to be one thing or it's not going to be all policy, nor is it going to be all individual choice. That said, I think the individual choices where everyone should start, some easy things like getting a thermostat that shuts off on and off, you can program it, you know, shutting out the lights in your computer when you leave, it sounds trite and boring, but it actually works. You know, having a vegetarian diet, um, being really, um, I guess, conscious and deliberate in terms of how many children you have. Um, they say that, you know, the number one solution of one of the top things we can do is just have better women's health education um, and again that's an issue of um, population control or um, population I guess growth maybe is a better way to put it um, I think things have to happen on the policy level and the governmental level as well I'm not a policy wonk um, I don't have a keen insight into that um, right. but I know it's important um, but yeah all the cards on the deck right there um, and then there's lots of things in between Again, that's kind of at the grassroots level where there's small groups or organization groups or neighborhood groups. Um, I think there's a lot of untapped potential for that. But again, you're starting to see that groundswell right now. All right. Thank you very much for speaking with us today, David. Thank you. Is it recording? <laughs> <laughs> I think How so. How do you do?
We all learned a lot from this project, and if there's anything that you take away from this video, I hope that it's this. We all have a responsibility to take care of our planet. It isn't always fun, usually it's a pain in the ass, but it's the only one that we have, and we shouldn't just let oil billionaires take it away from us, because they will if we let them.